people in America fear their government, and the government is being run by too many powerful agencies like the IRS and others, I think it's time the people take the country back through their representative government. Hi, welcome to Freedom TV, and have we got the show for you. If there has ever been anything you wanted to know about solar power and solar lights and solar voltaics, today is the show for you. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, but first off, we're going to get to Chris Janowski, Surviving and Thriving. And this is a very, very special segment because Chris talks about surviving with what you have on you. Like you're just caught out there and there's nothing that you can do and you have, you're, you've got to survive with what's on you. So here's some excellent suggestions. So this is Chris Janowski, Surviving and Thriving. You know, there's this survival situation. It says I'm unloading my pockets. Sort of to the old term that, uh, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And this is true. And in a survival situation, people kill people. The woods doesn't kill them, they kill themselves. Let's take a look and see what we've got on us. Well, I've got a diamond sharpener here. It weighs almost nothing, I always keep it with me because I've always got a knife with me, always. I've got an older fashioned cigarette lighter with me. I've got a survival knife that I like a whole lot. It's got one blade, and it's got the saw, the one you saw me work with before. Also got a screwdriver tip on it, sort of nice. A can opener, I don't plan on opening any cans, but something you might want to know right now, this can opener makes a real good dislodging hook to take a hook out of a fish's mouth if it's down, or I should say in his throat, when it's down deep in his throat. I've got some money here. This is really going to do me a lot of good. It's not going to buy me hamburgers and french fries out here, but it makes excellent fire starter. And that's what we'll use it for. And not to mistake this money clip that's on the outside. Nice shiny gold color. This looks like fishing lures to me here in the future. We're getting to the bottom. Got two quarters in here. I'm not too sure what we'll do with those, but there's a use. We'll figure them out. I've got a set of keys. I really need these out here. But there's all kinds of hardware attaching these keys together, which I'm sure I'll use. Plus a P38 can opener. I don't know. We'll find out. I also have another knife. This knife here opens with one hand. It's real nice if you injure the other hand. <laughs> Nothing else in my pockets down there. I've got a Leatherman that I always keep with me. This is something I like to make note of. Of all the tools I've seen, this is one of the most handy for the woods and for everywhere. It's got a nice pair of needle nose pliers. It's got a pair of wire cutters on it. Got serrations in here that we can work a nut or a bolt or whatever we might have to do. Uh, the Leatherman is the original inventor of this thing. There's some cheap Taiwanese things out right now. 
You don't want to get that. You want to get something that's called Leatherman. But this tool I would not be without. Whenever I put my pants on in the morning, this thing is always with me. It's got a metal file and a wood file. Small screwdriver. It's got a large Phillips head screwdriver. All these tools work real well. They don't get worn easily. It's got another knife blade. This knife holds an edge surprisingly well, too. It's got an awl for punching into leather or boring our holes in our trees to put sticks in there to make our triggers. It's got a very large screwdriver tip. And there's a medium screwdriver tip in here. So it's quite a useful tool. I use this almost every day. It's really a nice tool and it's something you should have with you. As I go through my person, or in my top pocket, I've got a pen. I'm really not sure what I'd use this for, but it certainly looks like a spear tip to me. We could use that, or maybe to write down some information I want to remember on that money. I always keep a... safety pin in my pocket, pinned on the inside. There's my fishing hook when I need it, and my rod tip eye. There's another thing that I have here. It's a long needle with an end on it. And it's called a chin. It's an oriental weapon that ladies used to keep in their hair, and they put poison on these things. We talked about poison before. This would make an excellent spear tip, very deep penetration if we're administering poison. It's also good for a whole lot of stuff. And uh, so I keep this with me all the time. But this is so, just sort of showing you what you can have on your person at the time. These are a lot of tools to work with. I also keep this one particular knife in my boot. It's called an aider. And this particular knife is, uh, is really a nice knife. It's uh, made in uh, Spain. Again, there's some other cheap imitations of it. The one you want to get would be an aider, though. It's almost indestructible. It's a nice skin and knife. It's got a barb on it, as you can see. It's got really nice finger grooves so you can hang on to it. It's not going to slip in your hand. Um, it's got a special setup here where you can work different nuts and bolts if you have to. Um, there's a screwdriver on the end of it. There's a can opener. There's all kinds of stuff on here. What I like about it, as we talked about a spear before, this right here would have lashed on here just like this, and you're all ready to go without finding some bone. You've got a beautiful spear here, which we can poison, and which we would poison. So those are the kind of things you'd have on you. Whenever I go deep into the forest, or if I'm flying over the forest, or if I'm flying, or I'm even traveling, I always take this survival kit with me, and it's on me. It's hooks right on my belt. It doesn't take up any room. You can see this is pretty tiny. Inside of this kit, and I've probably been asked more about this kit than I've been asked about anything. We get letters every day on this. Uh, we can just start from one end or the other. There's a knife in here. So now we've got two knives to work with. Any one of these knives could be lashed also to make a spear. We've got a sharpener. This is called an easy lap sharpener. It's, got, it's diamond impregnated. It's really nice. We can use it for a marlin spike, sharpen a knife with it. I've got this wrapped with fishing twine. So this twine is right on here. Makes it real nice. If we take it apart, I can use it as a straw to suck water out of small seeps that I normally couldn't get at. There's a flint in here that we can spark now and we can make happen with any one of our knives so we can start our fires whenever we want to. In here I've got a old GI match container. It's wrapped with more fishing line. We've got some 
tape that's holding it together that we can reuse over again. Inside we've got a special fire starter that we've talked about before, the cotton batten that's soaked with Vaseline, very easy to spark, makes a very hot fire starter. Also in here, we've got a small spool of wire. It's hard to believe all the stuff is coming off of me here. This small spool of wire we can use for trip wire to make a trigger work. We can use it for snares, whatever we have to. Got a small plastic box here, which has got a lot of fishing lures in it and some large hooks. Remember we talked about the gaff and stuff like that. You're going to want to have a couple of those large hooks, a couple of spoons, some small lures in here, a little bit of lead shot. Right in here, we just have, this wouldn't be something you'd have to have. It's nice to have. It's, a, it's an old broken sawzall blade for cutting metal. It's, very, it's in very good shape, so you can use it for cutting metal if you have to. Got a signal mirror in here. Nice and bright and shiny. We're going to show you how to use this. Got a ring saw that actually works. This saw really cuts well. We can cut a pretty good sized piece of wood in two with this. We've got twine for securing things together, making our spears and whatever. A few more fishing lures. We've got a couple of snares. Our small snares already made up just for a situation just like this. So that's what you're going to have on you or something similar to it. And if you've got a survival kit with you, you actually you're in pretty good shape. Again, your attitude, you should, you should start to feel really good about it because you can do a whole, with this amount of equipment, I can stay out here indefinitely and so can you. Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV. And today I'm here with John Patterson from Mr. Sun Solar. And I'm really excited to find out about this because to me, solar, solar power is like solar power. Okay, what does that mean? And could you describe to me first off, John, what do people mean when they mean solar power? To me, it means like a flashlight powered by the sun. But I'm sure it means a whole lot more than that in well, general. Um, it means the, the energy source, the immediate energy source was the sun. So um, I had a, um, an, a physicist one time who uh, went and inspected some solar water heating systems that I had installed. And um, he, asked, he asked me the question, he said, do, you, do your customers realize that the heat that is in their tank of water um, 10 minutes before was in the sun. Oh, really? I never thought of it that way. Yeah, and um, I said, well, I guess people kind of realize that, but they, <laughs> they, you know, don't probably think of it like that. No, but, you, uh, don't. you don't. Uh, so, you know, usually when you're trying to get, uh, use solar energy, you're, you're either looking for heat or you're looking for electricity, and there's different collectors that right. will collect uh, either of those. Right, so that's basically what you're looking at. When, when people say solar, they're talking usually about heat or light. Yes. So that's the two well, main functions yeah, well, yeah, of heat, bringing solar. Yeah, heat, light, or electricity. Now, as I understand it, solar's really kind of come into its own in the last few years. Up until just a few years ago, it was, it was considered really expensive, and it was kind of, people had this image of it as being, well, I don't know whether this is going to work, but... Your solar, the, the stuff that you use and talk about and, and install is like, well, it's an everyday thing. It's, it's becoming more commonplace. Uh, it still is relatively expensive. Uh, but what's happened in recent times is that there are uh, a whole set of incentives that together right. uh, bring the cost down to where it's affordable for a great many people. Right, and the, the idea with the incentives is that if I, well, you describe it better than I can. How, how do these incentive think programs work? Because this is one of the things that we highlight on this show is, is solving problems without using the government. But this is kind of a halfway house of where 
you're not so much using the government like you don't get government grants and the government doesn't do businesses like yours. However, we're getting our tax dollars back from the government for, as an incentive to do this. So how does that the, the incentive program work? There's three incentives uh, for most most people in Oregon uh, that could, could uh, avail themselves to. Uh, the first is uh, Energy Trust of Oregon incentive. It's a, it's a cash incentive and the, the money for that incentive comes from ratepayers of Portland General Electric, uh, Pacific Power, Northwest Natural Gas. Right. Uh, each each um, of the ratepayers pays 3% of their bill each month into a fund that is administered by the Energy Trust to uh, pay for uh, insulation and solar, renewable energy. Uh, take an $8,000 solar water heating system as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, the Energy Trust incentive for, for that is about $1,000. Right. All right, then we have a state tax credit um, that is a maximum of $1,500, and most solar water heating systems would qualify for that amount. Um, the, the way a, a tax credit works is that it's, it's the government, whether it be the state or the federal government, saying to you, we will allow you to, to use a portion of your own tax money right. to invest in solar. And so instead, uh, if you did your state income tax uh, return and, and you owed the state $5,000 and um, you put in a solar system that earned a credit of $1,500, you would just pay $1,500 less of the in, in state right. taxes. I see. So you're actually or so getting... you'd get a refund of $1,500. Right. So it's really, they're letting you uh, dedicate that portion of your taxes uh, for, um, for renewable energy. Then the federal government gives a 30% uh, tax credit. Really? Uh, yes, this is a new thing. It's only wow. been in existence for three years. Really? I've, ne I've never heard of this one. So the federal government is giving you, is this on your federal taxes? The federal tax oh, return. Oh, really? 30%? Uh -huh. Yes. So a third, But there's a maximum of $2,000 uh, for a residential application. Oh, okay. So if you add those up, you have 2000 from the federal, 1500 from the state, and a thousand from Energy Trust, uh, that is forty-five hundred dollars of the cost of an eight thousand dollar system. Right. So um, that's the thing that's been new in recent years that has caused solar to really take off is that right. the the incentives have, are better than they've ever been. Right. So that people are advancing and, and using the incentives to be the front, the early adopters of mm -hmm. this program of trying to switch over to using more solar right. things. Now, I've heard a lot of different terms about solar. Can you kind of explain some of these? Like, what's the difference between, or is there any difference between things like photovoltaic and just solar? Is, is photovoltaic solar? Yes. Or is, okay, so that's... Well, uh, some um, little bit of term definition, I guess, yeah. you, you, would, you would start. Uh, there's, there's two major worlds of solar energy. Solar thermal, which is taking sunlight and making heat. Okay. This would be the whole category of uh, solar water heaters, solar swimming pool heaters. Right. Solar systems designed to heat the home. The product is heat. You're after heat. Uh, and then the other is solar electric and we take the word photo for light right. and voltaic for voltage put those two words together photovoltaic those are uh, solar energy collectors called modules that actually take sunlight and make electricity directly right at the impact of the light upon the silicon right. wafer it makes electricity this uh, you, you the, the solar panels have a bunch of uh, wafers together, linked together with ribbon conductors between, and the electrons actually flow along a uh, conductor path mm. to a load. So, you know, like back at science projects, uh, kid, right. kids have yeah. played with that and made little fan motors go mm -hmm. and yeah. lights come on, things like that. That's just a, a circuit, electrical circuit. Well, we can put a lot of solar panels together and make enough to power our entire homes. We can make enough right. to make our, hmm. our meter go backwards. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> we can do it on a community level and, and do a whole community. I have enough solar panels on my building uh, to completely power my building. 
uh, commercial industrial facility of 10,000 square feet. Hmm. So you can do anything with this energy. Um, it's just a matter of deciding what you want to do and uh, figuring out the sizing. Right. Now, I, I, a couple of people have said to me, oh, you're in Oregon and you're doing solar. <laughs> and I'm going, well, we still get the sun sometimes. How does that work out here in Oregon as opposed to someplace like Arizona where the sun's sort of like permanent? <laughs> <laughs> Every place in the world has a, um, a peak sun uh, factor. Um, and Oregon is, um, in, in, the, the, in the western half of Oregon, uh, the, the, the rainy part, we get the equivalent of four peak hours of sun per day. Hmm. Uh, Bend and, and uh, the other side of the mountains get more like five and a half to six peak hours of sun. So we still get two-thirds as much as the sunny parts of the state, even over here right. in the west. Um, the sunniest places in the world get seven peak hours of sun. Oh, really? Yes. So we're not really that far behind. No. So it not. doesn't have to be blazing hot Arizona, you know, no. dying of thirst sun. It just has to be not completely overcast. Right. So well, the, yeah, and the thing that's deceiving about it, um, for instance, we get um, about two-thirds of the usable solar radiation that Los Angeles gets. Mm. Well, anyone who's been down there will say, well, it's, it's much sunny. It's sunnier there. It's two or three times sunnier there. And what we fail to recognize is that uh, even on cloudy days, sunlight is coming through the clouds. Our collectors are collecting that, making heat, making electricity, and that counts. Oh, really? So it, sure. it doesn't have to be a completely clear day. No. The sun is actually getting through the clouds. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, then that makes sense. So, but it, direct sun is far greater. Uh, you know, direct sun is like six times stronger than right. indirect sun. So certainly, uh, a clear day is better than a cloudy day. But the cloudy days, we get something. Uh, half of our time is clear. Yeah. You know, we got have to be honest. I mean, September, very sunny month, and right. so is August and July, and and uh, we get lots of clear winter days scattered through uh, the, the, the rainy part of the year. Uh, so overall, um, we get uh, two-thirds as much usable solar energy as pretty much any place in the world. So we, we're, we're doing okay. Sure. So yes. that you can feasibly do this with your, obviously, if people are installing this stuff left, right, and center. Now, I know we have a few photographs that uh, I wanted to bring up so we can have a look at some of the things. These are uh, some of the other things that you provide. I know at the end we have sort of a, a little synopsis of uh, some classes that you hold. But if we could bring those uh, slides up and we can have a look at those. This is their installing. This is what it looks like from the rooftop, huh? Right. Now, uh, we have two electricians there in that picture. Um, that system behind them is, um, uh, on the lower part of the roof, is solar water heating panels. Mm. That's uh, enough to heat the hot water for a 40-unit uh, hotel facility. Really? Mm -hmm. And then above them um, uh, are photovoltaic modules. And that is a three kilowatt photovoltaic uh, system. That is over in the uh, sunny part of the Cascades, uh, where they get um, uh, about five and a half peak hours of sun per day. So that system will uh, give um, you take the peak sun hours, five and a half times the kilowatt uh, size of the system, which is three. So we would get 16 and a half kilowatt hours per day wow. from that system. That's a fair amount of electricity. Yes, that's, that would power uh, an efficient home. I would provide all the electricity for a, a pretty efficient home. Right. Great. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. And the next one is the, my personal favorite. This looks like a... No, this isn't a solar tube. This is... Well, the one on the left is a solar tube. Right. So um, the natural lighting, of course, is far superior to any sort of mm. artificial lighting. Boy, I can tell you that. And um, the most efficient way to get natural lighting into a, a room is through a product called a tubular skylight. So in the upper left-hand corner of, of that shot, you have the, uh, a domed um, uh, transparent um, 
skylight, I guess is the yeah. <laughs> best term. Uh, it, it, it collects the energy and channels it down through that, that tube that's going through the attic in the picture. And then it, it uh, arrives in the room where uh, a diffuser, diffuser um, scatters the light so that it, instead of seeing a round circle on the floor, for instance, right. uh, the, whole, the whole room is illuminated brightly. And those things are absolutely thrilling. Um, they, they provide so much light. Uh, and they are the most efficient way to get light into a room because... Yeah, uh, they are exceptional. The, the, you're only talking about a two square foot opening in the ceiling where uh, there's, there's uh, potential heat loss. Of mm -hmm. course, there would be heat loss in the wintertime, uh, but the value of the light far exceeds the heat losses. So yes. this is a, a terrific way to get light into a room. Well, we did. We actually put one into our house, and and we kept trying to turn off the kitchen light for the next two weeks because it was so light. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. And the other photographs are. This is in. This is in, oh, well, we were going to talk about the attic fan, but well, that's okay. Well, that's the that's an <laughs> that's attic, the attic fan, fan, too, fan that the, the woman is pointing to. Yes, and that once again is uh, it's similar to a tubular skylight in the way it's installed. Uh, a, a hole about. Uh, 15 inches in diameter is right. cut into the roof, uh, and this takes, um, instead of putting light into the room, there's a fan on the underside of this unit that is powered by a, a small photovoltaic module on the very top of the unit, and it, it uh, sucks hot air out of the attic and expels it into the And it's all the done by the, the solar the energy from the top yes. of the fan. Excellent. Right. Sun and comes I, out, the fan comes on, uh, and it, it cools down the attic really? uh, considerably. Excellent. Yes. And I think we have one or two more. I can't remember. This is, oh, this is, I think this is the last one in this series, and we'll do a second one. Those are, I think the right one is the, the classroom. You did a classroom education. I get quite a few invitations to talk in schools, and I always enjoy doing that. Um, I, I want uh, students to be mm. aware that solar energy is going to be the, the prominent thing in the, their energy future. Mm. And um, then the one on the left is a class that I've been teaching at Portland Community College for several years on practical solar applications for the Northwest. Excellent. Well, that's an excellent grouping. I, I like okay. that. We'll get some more photographs in the next section. And we're going to take a very short break now. Um, well, this is a little bit longer than we normally have. And we're going to have one of our favorite videos, and this is called We're the Government and You're Not. So sit back, have fun. A nation is known by its people. Throughout this world, America is known because of the diverse group we call Americans. They're black and white and every color in between. Men, women, young, old, all share dedication to the American dream and to the idea that we all share equally in the task of building and strengthening our democracy through good citizenship. But what does it mean to be a good citizen today? What do you owe to your fellow man and to your government? In the next few minutes, we're going to answer that question. Obey these rules instead of following your heart or your head. Why? Because we're the government and you're not. Tom is a businessman who employs 12 people in his small restaurant. He started with nothing and has made himself a wealthy man through hard work and long hours. He knows that it's his work and the hard work of millions like him that creates wealth and provides jobs for an entire nation. But at this moment, he's wondering whether it's all worth it. As the tax audit goes on, Tom's patriotic desire to help the economy and provide jobs for working Americans starts to fade. He experiences strange emotions of fear and greed, wanting to keep his money all for himself. <laughs> Finally, in desperation, his greed reveals itself through latent homicidal tendencies. But what Tom doesn't understand is that everything depends on wealthy people paying their taxes. Where would we be without their money? 
tobacco farmers wouldn't get the subsidies that allow them to provide high-quality cigarettes to the world. Disadvantaged young mothers wouldn't be able to have food stamps that let them obtain the necessities of life. Scientists couldn't do highly important research on methane gas from cows, and other countries wouldn't get the foreign aid that helps them trade with us and learn our democratic ways. So when Tom wishes he could keep more of what he produces for himself, he's just being selfish and short-sighted. Yes, since Tom is a very productive citizen, he owes everything to us. So Tom and others like him should be thankful that the tax man doesn't take it all. So lesson number one is, pay your taxes and be thankful that we let you keep any of your money. Next, we turn our attention to Mary. She has a great entry-level job at a bank and she was taught to be responsible with her money. She's a very frugal person and never spends money when she doesn't have to. By careful shopping, Mary doesn't spend money on expensive furniture. Mary lives in a modest home in the basement of an old apartment building, but she has a keen sense of style within the confines of her meager budget. She isn't the sort of frivolous person who spends lots of money for gourmet food. She saves every penny she can by eating thrifty meals. Mary is also careful to conserve her resources. For instance, she hasn't had to buy new napkins or paper towels for months. But as Mary looks at the economy, she's troubled and she wonders what she can do to make a difference so that everyone can live a better life. But what Mary doesn't know is that today's modern economy is built on credit and spending, not on thrift and savings. Responsible people know that they should be borrowing and spending all that they can. Even things that were considered frivolous spending in the past are now understood to be powerful generators of wealth for certain people. Take gambling, for instance. What better way to have fun and pump money back into the economy than to blow a few hundred dollars of your savings on a state lottery or at a casino? And what about that big screen plasma TV you've always wanted? No cash, no problem. Just say, charge it, and take it home to your family. You see, debt is good for the economy. When you borrow money, you pay large interest payments. This props up bank profits and makes everyone feel good. So buy that impressive house. Fill it with expensive furniture that you can't pay for and keep those credit cards maxed out all the time. In addition to keeping corporate profits high, you also help spend trillions of dollars for products made in other countries, which makes foreign governments happy and makes state dinners at the White House more festive for everyone. Also, remember that by spending money on expensive things you can't afford, you encourage your neighbors to do the same thing, and you teach your children that outspending others is the key to happiness. Mary's learned her lesson. Her credit card is her friend, and she's boosting the economy while she lives a better life. So lesson number two is, spend all the money you can. Don't be greedy and save it for yourself. In every group, there are a few bad apples who want to make life difficult for everyone. And that's true even among Americans. There are some people who are just naturally rebels and troublemakers. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. These are the people who ask the questions that don't need to be asked. Why aren't other political parties allowed on the ballot? Why do Democrats and Republicans get to make up rules to keep other parties off? As we all know, our two-party system is a cornerstone of the Constitution. Allowing different ideas on the ballot would just confuse everyone. Imagine where that confusion might lead. We could end up with something dangerous like libertarians in Congress. And you know what that would mean. Why does our government spend so much time and money telling other countries what to do? Doesn't it just make them hate us and cause problems down the road? As the world's one remaining superpower, the United States has a sacred duty to tell other countries what to do. One of the fundamental responsibilities of a superpower is to bully other countries and create conflicts which then require us to solve. This is especially popular among broadcast media who see their ratings go up during times of world crisis 
as viewers tune in to see bodies being blown up on live TV. Why do they spend billions of dollars to try to stop illegal drugs when the same tactics didn't work with alcohol prohibition? Yeah, and why does the government even pay farmers to produce another dangerous drug, tobacco? Some people just don't understand politics. You see, it is younger people who abuse certain drugs, so they are illegal. But because older people vote and hold their legislators accountable, the drugs they abuse are legal. It's really the only fair way. As you can see, these troubled youth are asking questions which are bad for public morale and clearly indicate that they favor criminal activity. There's really only one place that's appropriate for people who ask questions like these. Why? Because we're the government and you're not. So lesson number three is don't cause trouble by asking embarrassing questions or by not supporting your government. So now you know how to be the kind of citizen your government wants and needs. Pay your taxes without complaint. Spend all you can in order to help the economy. And don't ask questions that don't need to be asked. If you follow these simple rules, you'll be a good, patriotic American citizen. Jenkins and propaganda. I can't take your call, so leave me a message. Yeah, um, this is Bill House at the IRS. Um, we've reviewed the video that you sent over, and we really think you need to make the tax guy seem nicer during the audit. You know, more talk about voluntary compliance and all that garbage. Um, Make him look like somebody's nice uncle or something. It, it, it makes us look like we're not so nasty, okay? <clears throat> uh, this is Barry Sands of the DEA. We just got a copy of that thing about how to be a good citizen, and this thing has got to be changed. There's nothing in here about the evils of drugs and how using drugs is the same as supporting terrorists. Now, you know the routine. We've got to make changes to this ASAP, so call me and let's get together on it. I uh, won't be in the office this afternoon, though, because I'll be at uh, driving school so I can get out of that DUI I got last month. But uh, call me, all right? Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV, and we're here with John Patterson and Mr. Sun Solar, and we're just getting stuck into the solar energy thing with all of the things that you can do with it. I didn't understand that, that it was basically two separate things of heating and lighting. And I know solar has been around for a while, but how long has, have people been putting systems like this in their homes? Um, I would say the modern era of solar in this country is uh, about 30 years. Really? Um, I started in 1980. Mm. Uh, all that any solar companies were doing in the area and, and at that time uh, was solar water heating systems. Right. Um, Jimmy Carter and his administration instituted federal tax credits and the state of Oregon uh, followed and uh, there, there was sort of a just a uh, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it came into existence. Right. And um, then uh, solar pool heating sort of got mm. discovered, and people with swimming pools who spend a tremendous amount of money and a yeah. tremendous amount of, of carbon-based energy uh, heating swimming pools um, realized they could completely heat the pool with solar mm. and shut off the gas heater. And uh, 
And so those became very popular. And then uh, in about 1990, mm -hmm. uh, solar photovoltaic systems started uh, uh, coming down in price. Those were first uh, developed for the space industry, but they, they got um, into a price realm where it made sense for people living off of the utility grid to right. power their homes with, right. with solar electric systems. Mm -hmm. And so that became popular, and as prices continued to drop dramatically, uh, even urbanites started buying <laughs> <laughs> solar um, photovoltaic systems. Right. So you can actually, in theory, you could put a, a system on top of a house that could take care of all of your hot water and all of your electricity needs, and you could possibly look at selling it back to the, the power company. Yes, that's possible to really? do. Really? Mm -hmm. Even here in Oregon, we can do that. That's yes. excellent. That's amazing. We, we can do that because of uh, something called net metering. Okay. Uh, net, net metering is a law that was uh, passed, and most of the states in the country have net metering laws now. And it, it, it basically allows you to put solar panels on your home that in certain parts of the year will actually generate more power than, than the home needs. Mm. That goes back to the grid, and you get uh, credit at the same retail rate as, as you pay for, for uh, electricity in the wintertime. Mm, okay. So if you, if you just had a solar water heating system, you couldn't, you couldn't do that uh, because right. uh, any day the sun is out, you'd have all the hot water you needed. But if it weren't sunny, you would be taking cold showers. Right. <laughs> so the way solar water heaters work is that they preheat the incoming cold water with solar and then... Um, uh, the backup heater remains in place and uh, provides the rest. But if this backup heater happens to be electric, which still most water heaters are right. electric, and you have a photovoltaic system uh, that in the summertime can provide uh, an excess of power, <clears throat> then certainly by net metering you can do the whole thing, both solar hot water and right. uh, electricity for the whole home, 100% um, renewable. Right. Do you need a certain amount of area in order to do this, like in a house? Like we have a really small house, it's 840 square feet, so we mm -hmm. don't have a huge roof area that we could put something like that on. Is that feasible in a house that's that small? Yeah, you don't need that much. You only need about 60 square feet of roof area for oh, okay. a solar water heater. And um, 85 square feet of roof area will put in a one kilowatt photovoltaic system. Uh, of course, that only gets you uh, about four kilowatt hours a day in, on this side of the mountains. Uh, but if you if you use energy wisely and have all sorts of good conservation measures in place, right. then you might not need more than ten or twelve kilowatt hours a day. Mm. Uh, in which case, a size roof like you're talking about would be perfectly adequate. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. I didn't think that it would be even feasible on a house that's, th that's as small as ours, but that's good news. Yeah. In fact, smaller homes are easier to do than bigger homes. Hmm. Bigger homes use proportionately greater energy um, right. because there's more heating to be done and, hmm. and you, you have to uh, do more lighting and so on. So to conserve first is always the, the wiser thing to do and to have a small uh, home that uh, doesn't require a great deal of energy hmm. makes the solar component more affordable. Excellent. Well, I know we have a few more photographs that we'd like to share with you. So if we can bring those up, we'll have a look at uh, the rest of them. This is an installation at the Capitol, obviously. Yes, this is the Oregon State Capitol. We were the first uh, uh, state to do that on their, their state capitol building. And this was a very interesting cooperative venture. Um, there was uh, a handful of suppliers that offered uh, solar modules and the other equipment uh, necessary for a complete system uh, at cost to the state. Hmm. And then the, um, the uh, labor was provided pretty much as a volunteer endeavor by uh, solar energy companies such as my own. Uh, the IBEW uh, brought electricians there, um, uh, along with others th that are in the solar business, and um, everyone worked together and, and provided this, uh, this system at cost to the state. Mm. So it was very... Well, then they should publicize you guys, because I didn't hear anything about this. They should tell people this. 
This is, you know, this is something they need to be getting back to us about. Well, that's true. They do have monitoring equipment, and they have a, a kiosk in the Capitol, and uh, uh, people are, because um, you can't see the panels up on the roof. No, you, obviously. You wouldn't know that they were there, but they, I think they do try to uh, have students, um, you know, school children that come to the state Capitol um, are, are taken by the kiosk mm, and, and uh, given information. And this is two more installations? Yes, the one on the right is a solar pool heating system. Um, you can sort of see the proportion there that you, you need solar panels that are roughly half of the surface area of the swimming pool mm. to completely heat it, but the, it certainly will do that. And that's a very low cost technology. You can solar heat just about any swimming pool for under $5,000. Wow. And uh, the, the payback is, is usually two to three years. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Whoa, and I didn't realize pools use that much heat oh energy. Yes. They, they're a thousand to two thousand dollars every year. Oh, whoa. So, uh, then the house on the left has a solar water heating system. Uh, you can't really see it very well um, because the, the panel is parallel to the roof, uh, but that's how most solar uh, systems are mounted. So there's an awful lot of them out there. There's 30,000 solar energy really? systems in Oregon. That's amazing. And people would not ever believe there's that many, but they're on the backs of houses. They're, yeah, they're but, and you don't see them. It used to be, I remember, you, used, you would see them, they would be like standing up. Right. But um, most of the solar ones I've seen, the, only when you get back maybe a block can you even tell that they're there. In the early 80s, all of us put put everything at a 45 degree tilt, mm. which is you know matching the latitude for our area. And uh, there was a study done in the early 80s that indicated that that actually wasn't as efficient at, as a lower angle, mm. fa favoring the summer sun, uh, where we get more, more of our right. annual yield. And this is one that's not even on a house. Yes, so but you don't have to put mount? solar panels oh, on, a, on a roof. Uh, you can put them up on a pole. These are solar electric panels uh, over in Ladd's Edition. Uh, really? Close in southeast. Huh. Um, it was the only space uh, on the property that had, a, had sufficient sunlight. Oh. Uh, so the, the roof was uh, shaded by trees mostly. Mm. This is known as a ground mount system. Um, that's a solar water heating system um, with the, uh, the holding tank on above the collectors. That's a specific kind of system. Not too many of those go in here, but um, the, the ground is a real good place for a system like that because all the weight of that, that big 80 gallon solar holding tank is, is uh, bearing on the, the earth rather than having to be supported by right. the roof. Oh, okay. So the rule is that solar panels do not have to go on a roof, they just have to go in the sun. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. This There's is a, a photovoltaic system on a barn out in Hillsboro, um, about a three kilowatt system. It's taking up about 300 square feet of that, that roof. There's plenty more. and. Uh, the owners there could add to that if they ever wished. And so you can add on to something yes, like this? Yes, they're very oh, okay. incremental. Uh, you, can, you can add more modules at a later time. This one's down in Canby, Oregon. I, I like the reflection of the trees in the sky on mm -hmm. the solar array. It's very pretty. Um, th that owner covered every inch of the roof he could. Really? <laughs> Excellent. He's making biodiesel uh, oh. there and using solar power to run the uh, now that's efficient, such, yes. using solar power to make biodiesel out of refuse from your farm. That's, that's excellent. Right. And here's kind of a, a graph of how it all happens. Yeah, that would be a, a typical solar water heating system. You have uh, the solar collector, the thermal collector on the left. Uh, you have the, uh, the solar holding tank in the middle with the heat exchanger coil in the center. You have a pump between that tank and the, and the collector that circulates uh, fluid up to the collector. Um, and then the, the little tank above the solar holding tank is a reservoir tank, so this would technically be known as a drain back system, one of the most uh, reliable systems. Um, then all that uh, uh, heating occurs while the sun's out during the daytime. Then uh, whenever people draw hot water, uh, the, the solar preheated water travels to their backup heater. If it's been a sunny day, and uh, the solar water is already heated to 120 degrees or greater, then the backup heater doesn't even come on. Mm. And, um, but if it's been overcast and the solar is only at 80 or 90, the backup heater will boost it the rest of the way. So you always have uh, as much or more hot water than you ever had before. Excellent. 
Well, that's that's an excellent summation. I, I like the little diagram because it kind of leads you through it, and it, it helped me really understand how the process worked because I just had this sort of, uh, how, okay, panels on roof, somehow the hot water gets into the hot water heater. Now, we do have an opportunity, if anyone who's uh, watching the show has a question, you can give us a call and you can ask Mr. Patterson directly and get the real information about photovoltaics. Takes me a bit of energy and time to say that word, but I like it. Photovoltaics. Yes. What's the, what's the most exciting thing you see in the horizon for solar? What's coming up? What's the new stuff? I, I'm pretty excited about zero net energy homes. Um, really? These are homes that generate all of their energy. Their, their space heating, their water heating, their electricity, their lighting. 100% from renewable energy sources hmm. on site. On site. Yes. So huh. um, this is a, um, um, a whole kind of new concept. Um, it's easy to do. Uh, generally, a home builder, if he wanted to do this, he would, he would probably build an, an all-electric home because the, the net metering part of that is mm -hmm. easier that way. Uh, they would um, maybe use a heat pump for space heating, which is a very efficient way. A ground source heat pump, if you have the, the ground, to a heat pump actually is drawing the heat out of the ground or out of the air and putting it to the space. Uh, all that you're running is compressors and pumps that use about a third or a fourth of the energy that, you, that would be required if you were burning fossil fuel mm. for, the, for, for space heating. Then you'd have a solar water heating system with electric backup and then you would have a photovoltaic system that would be sized to meet the entire load of the building. It would make right. up the, it would be, provide enough power to run the heat pump uh, space heating system, enough power to, to power the electric elements in, as the backup water heater mm. in the, the water heating system and of course all the lights and refrigeration and, and uh, all the other electrical components of a home. Right, so you could actually literally have a house that didn't take in outside energy. That's that right. It was, it, it's completely self-sufficient mm -hmm. as far as running its own energy. That's right. really an interesting idea. Yes, uh, well th that will be very commonplace in 10 or 15 years. Really? That's yeah. soon? Oh yes. Really? Yeah, people are doing it now and people are even doing it on businesses. Hmm. Uh, a, a, any, any facility, any building could, could be zero net energy uh, with um, a properly sized uh, photovoltaic system Excellent. and the other uh, components I Excellent. mentioned. I think we, do we have a phone call? Do we have a phone call coming in? I think we do. Would like to know if there's a backlog, how long it takes to get a system. Uh, yes, the question is uh, about backlog. If, if um, uh, the, there, there are um, uh, a lot of people wanting solar at this time, and mm. especially before the end of the year because the federal tax credit is due to expire. Oh, really? And Ooh. people are wanting to get that while, mm. while it can be gotten. Uh, so um, uh, my company is actually about three to three and a half weeks out on our installation mm. schedule. So that's not a problem now uh, as it's early September, but by November, yeah it might be a little touch and go as whether we can get the projects in by the end of the year. Right, so if you're going to think about solar, do it now. Do it do sooner. It Don't soon. wait till the last minute, Don't wait that's for sure. I, December 29th, that I want my system in <laughs> by the end of the year. It has to actually be operational by December 31st for oh, the tax okay. credit to, um, uh, to qualify. Okay, excellent. Oh, okay. Do we have another phone call? Another phone caller? Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, if you were starting from scratch, why wouldn't you have just photovoltaic and use electricity to uh, run your water heater if it's electric water heater rather than having installing both systems? Because I would think from the diagram, it looks like water uh, the water heater system has more complexity to it and pumps and more things that go wrong. So I was wondering what that your the answer would be to that. That's a good question and um, the, the best answer is that solar thermal systems are a lot less money than solar electric systems. 
it's a lot easier to get thermal energy from the sun than it is to get electricity. Uh, the, the efficiencies of solar thermal systems are up in the 80% efficiency range. Uh, the efficiencies of photovoltaic systems are down at around 20%. So um, if you were to, to do the whole thing with photovoltaic, you would spend um, two or three times more money in the end to, to do it that way. So the thermal energy is easy to get. And these systems, by the way, if the diagram seemed unduly uh, complicated, it's, they aren't really uh, complicated at all. Um, the, 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 there's four components in a solar water heater. You've got your tank and your solar thermal collector, but then your other component is uh, a circulating pump. And our, our solar water heating system, known as the Sol Reliant, uses a photovoltaic powered uh, pumping system. Mm -hmm. So a, a photovoltaic module actually powers that pump. So when the sun comes out, the pump turns on, the system heats water. Um, very, very, very reliable. Well, we can see that it's, it's not nearly as hard or as complex as I thought it was. And I want to thank you so much for being on the show and helping us out to get an idea of how this whole thing works and how it all goes together and, and the fact that there are two things. And I really appreciated your, your making the distinction between the cost for each system. So again, John, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate that. And we want to thank you guys for being on the show. And we hope that you will join us, not next week. We'll be off next week. But we will be back the following week with the show about Dove Lewis. And I think you'll want to tune in for that one and learn a little bit more about this organization. Thank you. I cry for my country For the pain that it's been through She's been made to suffer For the profit of a few Storm clouds are out forming Winds of change now touch our shores I hear forefathers are crying as the dreams been cruising America America I show my love for thee with strength and loyalty America America I show